Um, so uh, first of all, when we start to do a simulation, uh, this is uh, very close to the figure I showed before, but now we have this nice little loop here with a model system uh, where we, uh, we try to take the sea level hindcast and put some assimilation into it to get the best uh, initial field for our forecast, which is then used for, for the sea level prediction. So the purpose of the assimilation is really to get a good uh, starting field for our forecast. There are many different assimilation schemes out there uh, with different complexity, uh, 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 complexity. and uh, we've heard about the Kalman filter, which is one of the more complex, but you could actually start just by nudging your model towards uh, observations. And then uh, I will focus a bit on the optimal interpolation, which is sort of a simple uh, form of the Kalman filter. Just a few equations, this will be the only equations, almost the only equations today, or in this presentation. Um, we have some, uh, some state variables, uh, sea level, temperature, salinity and velocities. And uh, they are both, uh, we both have some observations and we have the model values for them. And the, the idea with the ensemble uh, optimal in interpolation is to, to uh, take the, um, uh, take the optimal combination of the forecast and the observations and put them together to uh, form a, an analysis. And uh, um, this P here is basically uh, the cross correlation between um, uh, one value and one point and then uh, the same type of, of values from surrounding points or um, like if we have sea level in one point, you can do correlation with sea level in, in neighboring points, or you could also do correlation with temperature in neighbor, neighboring points. And this forms a big matrix that you can use to relate um, your measurement in one point to the measurements in surrounding points and correct in your model in all these surrounding points. So that's sort of what's inside the equations, but I won't go into the details. That's a whole, new, a whole different course. Um, when you do uh, go into the coastal region, uh, data assimilation becomes challenging. You have uh, short temporal scales and short spatial scales compared to the open motion. Uh, you also uh, tend to have time-dependent error statistics, which is something that I will not look so much on today. Um, <coughs> Then the most uh, common open motion uh, sea surface height assimilation method is to adjust the, the mix, mixed layer depth. And that does not really work in a place like the North Sea where the water column is often mixed throughout. Um, then the standard open motion satellite products, you can get some really nice 2D maps that are, is often assimilated in, in open motion models, but they're not really good in the coastal area. Um, so at least within 50 kilometers of the coast, you should not use it. And also in areas with, with the short term variability, uh, you should not use it either. So um, that's not really, really the way to do it. Um, I will show you another approach that, that can be used. And then also um, uh, what you need to catch is really the barotropic signal, the tides and all this which is important for the sea level. So it's not so important to get the, the large scale feature or it's important to get the large scale features but you need the fine scale features as well. Okay. Um, if you, uh, if you want to have some sea level measurements, you have two different options. You have tide gauges, in situ measurements, and you have the altimetry. And uh, the tide gauges, they have high temporal resolution. Uh, we've heard about hourly data. You can get 10 minutes data. You can even get one minute data if that's what you want. Um, but it's single, single points and it's mostly at the coast. Uh, the Dutch have one uh, measuring station out in the open North Sea that provides uh, real-time data. Uh, but that's, I think, one of the only ones. Okay, the altimetry uh, has, as we heard already, a 10 or a 30 day repeat cycle. And uh, it also has, uh, but it has this uh, high resolution along track 
um, that I will show in a, in a second. Uh, but it has about perhaps 100 kilometers between tracks. And then if you have several different satellites, you might get uh, better spacing between tracks, but it's still limited, uh, the spatial resolution. But you do have measurements in the open water, and that's uh, an important difference compared to the tight gauges. Okay, just a quick uh, um, example of how you can work with tight gauges. The the Dutch uh, 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 the Dutch uh, um, operational system actually assimilates tight gauges along the British and the Dutch coast. Um, because uh, the, uh, the, um, the reason for doing this is that storm surges in the North Sea generally goes in this direction and then having information from these stations inside your model is actually benefiting the forecast in, uh, for, the, for the Dutch coast. Um, then in, in, the, in the template I had from Rory, um, it said that I should describe the ideal situation. And of course, the ideal situation for, for uh, set, uh, using altimetry in the coastal zone would be to have uh, altimetry coverage, which is dense enough to resolve the di dynamics in the coastal zone, and uh, that the quality of, of the data was good all the way to the coast. That's not quite the case right now, but um, we have to work with that. Then it should be high quality, easy to use, uh, data in near real time. Um, I would like it to have, like to have it within one hour. Um, the near real time we're getting there. The easy to use is so so, especially for the coastal data and the high quality. I mean that dep depends on what you define, how you define high quality. Um, so it's there's some work to do. Um, then I would like to have a processed, precise determination of, of tides, um, which is an area that has already been covered. And then Craig actually had a very nice comment on the reference levels. Um, one thing you have to realize is you can, you can when you do a ocean modeling, you can use the eTurbo2 e uh, data set, and that's very nice. I've heard several people around here doing that. When you want something higher, uh, higher resolution, you go to different national, national authorities and get data from them. And you have to realize that they're in some datum, and it's probably not the same as eTurbo2. And if you start to combine data from different countries, you can see what happens. So actually finding out what the reference level in your ocean model is can be quite complicated. Uh, then you also have to know the reference level of your tides and of your satellite altimetry. So you can see there's quite a bit of work there. And then we probably would like to have an advanced assimilation scheme. And the ideal output would be a systematic reduction of our peak error. And uh, we would also like to have a bit uh, a re reduction of the timing area <coughs> error in our storm search. And perhaps also in our general sea level forecast. So that's sort of the ideal situation. Um, but that's not quite where we are. So, uh, as I said, there is this open motion uh, as a symmetry product, um, and uh, one of the main providers of that, uh, probably the most used, is uh, the Aviso, uh, and uh, they have a high quality product that is uh, uh, for the open motion ocean, and it's quite easy to to download and use. It's a 2D map. Um, but when they do this interpolation to a 2D map, they of course assume something about the temporal and spatial scales, and that's not suitable for most coastal regions. Uh, also, uh, they do not do any special coastal processing. So this map actually shows just one cycle of altimetry data, and it shows where there's data for uh, just doing open motion processing, that's the green, and the red is where you can get extra data by doing something differently. So there's actually a lot, a lot of data in the coastal zone which is not included in, in a standard product like that. Then there's uh, the RATS database. That's a very good, nice source for a long track altimetry. So that's not a 2D map, that's single tracks. Uh, they have an easy to use web interface where you can also choose which, uh, which corrections to apply to the satellite signal, which means that you can get a lot more data in the coastal zone. 
and uh, they have all the different satellites and uh, and uh, you can choose an area of interest. Um, it's one hertz data, that means that they have data every about seven kilometers for the JSON. Um, so uh, that's sort of a uh, limitation compared to to the special coastal products. Um, with the special coastal products, you can you can get uh, high resolution data, um, 350 meters perhaps. But uh, you need quite a bit of special knowledge on uh, how to process the data um, because you got just get a big uh, NetCDF file for each track where you have to find out which corrections to apply yourself and uh, the user handbooks are sometimes very nice. Um, but uh, it takes some work and you also have to find out yourself uh, where to stop at the coast, how, how reliable the data is close to the coast. And my experiment, experience is that you also have to do some smoothing, smoothing of the, the data yourself. Um, so we have uh, at least three different sources, uh, the Pistache, the Alice, which is actually a part of, of the eSearch project, and then the CTO H. Um, there was, uh, the um, uh, slides I will show forward from here is all uh, data from the RATS database, so it's one hertz data. Um, except for this slide here. It's uh, the one example I have of a Danish storm search that was actually captured directly by, uh, by a satellite. Uh, we were so look lucky that this uh, Bodil storm in, that we have already talked a lot about in, in December, we had prize at passing right through. And this over here is the area that was uh, had the uh, most intensive flooding, but uh, we also see quite a bit of, of sea level signal here. Um, and this is actually model and tide gauge data from uh, from Kusia, which is right here. So that's pretty close to the track. And you see um, the satellite passing was right here, at this time here. So uh, that was uh, quite a lucky uh, lucky shot. And we can actually use it to compare uh, Crysat and, and model and tide gauge data directly. So that's quite a nice example. But you're not always that lucky. Um, most, most often you will not have a satellite n nearby when you need it. Um, and therefore we have uh, thought about what we can do in our region of the world. We have a, plenty of tight gauges and we have quite a long record of satellite data. So why not combine it? Um, we have made a blending method that uh, uh, make the best of the high temple resolution of, uh, of the tide gauges and also we have them in, in real time and then the spatial cover of the satellite data and we uh, use it to uh, provide an outcast of the sea level so not a forecast but at least an outcast and it's based on observations that means it's independent of on the weather forecast it's independent of on uh, any hydrodynamic model so we can use it as a standalone product product or we can use it to assimilate into our ocean model so um, once you have uh, uh, yeah once you have the satellite data in place and this is actually satellite data from from uh, topex and uh, uh, jason one when they were flying side by side so that's why the data coverage is quite dense dense for for the north sea and this is just showing the, the standard deviation of the data with tides in it. And then when, we, uh, with, when we've taken out the, the tides, and it shows uh, quite a, a large change. Here we have standard deviations of more than a meter, and here we're down to, to 30 centimeters. And this is just uh, uh, an example of, of uh, the amplitude of the M2 tide, which is the most important tidal component in, in the North Sea. Also in the Baltic Sea, the, the tides are small, so uh, that's actually just a change of color scale that makes a difference over here. Okay, then we have um, correlation between tide gauges and satellite data. So we started in the, in the Baltic Sea and then we're moving out in the, in the North Sea. And what you see is long correlation scales in the Baltic Sea. Um, and short correlation scales inside the Danish waters. 
But then as we go out in the North Sea in just a second, you'll see that the correlation is along the coast, and that's because we have the, the, the signal of uh, sea level uh, following the coasts. So uh, in the North Sea, you, you'll see uh, correlation scales of a couple of hundred kilometers along coast, and not so much out in the water. And in the Baltic Sea, we had these really long correlation scales of several hundred kilometers. Um, so that, that we used to, uh, to select which tide gauges to use in our statistical model. So we sort of uh, selected tide gauges that would, would not be too, uh, too correlated to each other. And then we set up a linear regression model taking um, the, uh, the satellite data and saying, okay, there should be a, um, a linear combination. Uh, they should be, uh, we should be able to describe the satellite data in one point by a linear combination of tight gauges surrounding that point. And uh, we, uh, we uh, in, uh, take the inverse of the model, and then that gives us model co coefficients. So for each tight gauge, we'll get a uh, for, for each point in, uh, in, along the satellite track, we'll get a coefficient of how much we should multiply our tight gauge level with to get the optimal combination for that single point. So um, I've taken an example from, from the ocean just uh, north of Copenhagen, and we see that the, the blue curve here is the full model, which is uh, the different tight gauges surrounding the area. Uh, given different weights uh, calculated up here, and um, the blue dots show the, the model uh, value at uh, the time of satellite observations, and the red dots are, are the satellite observations. So that's sort of the method that we, uh, we used. And uh, here's a few examples of, of regression coefficients given by, by station. So you can <coughs> kind of see that that, um, for instance, uh, the SPX station here on the Danish west coast uh, has um, given quite a lot of weight in this area here, close to the station, that's quite natural. Um, the, the station here has a larger area where it's uh, given quite a bit of weight, and that's just a signal of, of uh, how big a radius you can actually use this uh, the station in, but we combine all the different stations to, to give the best estimate, so we do, don't just use one station in one point. Okay, so the, the um, uh, st error statistics show something about how good the, model, uh, the quality of the model is, and what we see is that the, in the Baltic Sea it goes quite well, and in the North Sea it's also usable because we have, we have quite a large signal, but uh, our errors go up to about 10 10, 12 centimeters in most parts of the North Sea. But it's still, uh, compared to the search signals, it's still very useful. useful. Okay, so just a, a quick example here. Um, we had a storm back in 2006. And this is, again, a, a zoom in on the transition zone between the North Sea and the Baltic Sea. And this over here is our statistical model with data along the tracks. And this is our uh, uh, ocean model that, that we use for, uh, for forecasting. So the benefit now, compared to just having the regular satellite data, is that now we have data along all the tracks uh, all the time. So we have data in real time along all the tracks. So we, we are not depending on having a satellite passing right at the time of the storm. So this shows the development of the storm, um, and the, the important thing to remember is that two plots are completely independent, so uh, one can be used to, uh, to validate the other. And if, our, if we had our ocean model breaking down for some reason, we could actually use the, the uh, blended method to, to give a complete uh, uh, independent estimate. So that works quite well. And we can also calculate some statistics. Um, and I won't go into too much detail on that, but, but it works quite well. 
Okay, so now we have a blended model, uh, a blended product that we can use as input to our assimilation, and we also have an uh, assimilation scheme. And um, this is the model that I already introduced, so I will just go through it very quickly. This is our operational model setup, uh, but for assimilation experiments, we reduced the uh, the um, horizontal resolution uh, to uh, six nautical miles and we did not use the, the two-way nesting but except for that it's the same it's the same model code um, we did a 20 uh, year historical run and made the calculated correlations based on that and use that for uh, for the in, for input to the assimilation um, and this uh, shows some early results of, of uh, the assimilation. So, um, uh, for this early results, we do not have a proper handling of, of uh, tides. So we'll focus on the on the Baltic Sea and on a storm in 2005, which was uh, really bad in the in the Danish area and uh, over here by the Estonian coast. Unfortunately, my colleague chose not to take in the Tallinn station. That would be, have, have been a nice example. Maybe we'll add that later for uh, for <coughs> testing. So, but we do have um, uh, the uh, data from the Forsmark station here, up in in uh, Sweden, and uh, this uh, graph basically shows our our model in black, and then no, sorry the uh, the observations in black, and then the the model without assimilation in red, and the assimilated model in, in blue, showing some improvements at the uh, at the time of of the peak of the event, especially. So um, another example here from a bit further south, where the surge is actually negative. Um, the water was pushed into the Baltic Sea. And again, we see that the assimilated uh, model is closer to observations than the model without assimilation. So in the pipeline, um, we're planning to use a more dedicated uh, coastal uh, altimetry product, the ALICE product, um, and actually also the Pistache product, uh, product um, and that's to get closer to the coast. Um, let me just go back to show, like here. If we if we use a dedicated product, we can actually get data from an area like this, or in here, we can actually get closer to the coast. So that's the purpose. Um, then we will uh, uh, interpolate our blended product to a 2D map, so it's much easier to to get sort of an overview picture from it and we will make it operational so we have it in real time and uh, can provide it to uh, to the eSearch web page when we have an event um, and then um, we will also use this updated pro uh, blended product uh, in the assimilation um, I think what we uh, um, what is important to realize is that you have to have a setup of, of tight gauges, uh, but it would be uh, quite uh, easy and, and very nice to apply it to other places. Um, for instance, the Adriatic Sea, you actually have a nice setup with a, a lot of tight gauges al along the, the Italian and Slovenian coast. Um, so uh, you could do a, a nice job there, I think. And um, uh, there, there are also other places where, where it would be quite obvious to do. Uh, I know that there have been some people in Australia trying to do the same thing, and that sort of shows the limitations. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a map, map of Australia right now, but they tried to take a station in Darwin and use that for the whole North Australian coast, and that's not enough. So uh, that sort of shows the, the limitations as well. Um, at uh, Rutgers University, there is actually a group working with the 4D assimilation of, of uh, altimetry, and they actually, I think, now have an operational system um, where uh, they are simulating uh, a long-track satellite data. Um, 
So I will just show a few slides of that. This is, is a model domain with New York up here, and that's uh, sort of the the uh, American East Coast. And um, here you have uh, all the crosses. There, there are aviso points, and uh, aviso. This is this nice uh, 2D map of the altimetry. And as you see, they're not so critical with the coastline. It kind of goes in uh, uh, or the coast in several places, and you'll get data everywhere. And it looks nice, but it's not very useful. And then we have uh, the rats data coming in across here, and you see it. That's sort of the the limit, the true limit to how far towards the coast the, the satellite goes without special processing. Um, and this they all assimilated into, into their model. And this shows just one example of, of how the model changes when you start to assimilate, assimilate uh, um, the data. So uh, this is the model um, without assimilating data from the RATS database. And then you have this change here, or uh, this uh, difference in, in sea surface height once you assimilate it. So this is just uh, one, uh, one line coming from the coast out into the open open water, and you see the temperature, the salinity, and the uh, velocity uh, uh, along the coast, and you see uh, a change here, right, where you have the the additional slope in the sea level, and that actually creates some some eddy activity on the on the coast, and that's quite an important zone for for that. And it's just a few more details on on this. So, um, just to sum up, um, we have a, a sea level assimilation in, in the North Sea. Uh, um, sorry, a sea level as, assimilated, uh, assimilation in the North Sea uh, in operational models is, is very limited. We have the Dutch system with, where they're actually assimilating tight gauges right now, and to my knowledge, it's the only system doing that. Um, even though there is plenty of tight gauges available. Um, at DMI, somebody asked me about this uh, adjustment of sea level, and basically we've been doing that for many years. And the unfor un unfortunate thing I would almost say is that it works for us just as well as a real assimilation. So that kind of stops the process of assimilating data. But I think this assimilation of, of uh, satellite data can really um, do a lot of good in that direction to actually uh, um, uh, show that assimilation is also important. Um, the blending method combines the information from the tight gauge and the altimetry, and that means that we can actually obtain the temporal and spatial scale that we need. Um, and uh, we could also apply this to other locations, and that would be uh, uh, quite useful, I think. Um, and then uh, the e-search assimilation uh, results are still preliminary, but they show some, some improvements. That was it.